came to a revelation this morning that it's been a few weeks since I've had coffee in the morning on a Sunday morning, and it's delicious. I'm glad for a church that provides hospitality in the simplest of ways. I'm thankful for people that have signed up and volunteered who bring snacks and prepare coffee week after week. I know that there's a refrigerator back there that's got a water ready for me in case I'm dry up here, and sometimes, let's face it, I'm dry. This morning, what I want you to do is turn open in a Bible, back in the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 43. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I hope you understand this is not original. What this series is, is based on two books written by a pastor. And the first time some of those in the growth group saw him, they were kind of amazed because he's a young guy. David Platt um, was a pastor in one place. He was actually teaching in seminary. And something called Katrina came along and changed his life. And everything they had was gone. And God landed him in Birmingham, Alabama. And he was just doing pulpit supply because that's all he was looking to do. He enjoyed his work at the seminary. And the church said, sir, we'd like you to consider being our pastor. And he, if you've read the books, you know his answer was no. God's already got me doing something. And the more he prayed about it, the more he couldn't avoid it. And God has used this material uh, in several places to teach people about something beyond nominal Christianity. Beyond the way that we tend to do things, and particularly the North American church. So I'm only going to review back to last week. I'm not going to go all the way back. I just, I just want you to touch on a couple of things from last week. Our premise last week was that a radical vision requires radical cost. Radical vision requires radical cost. What God places before us is going to cost us if we're willing to go. And where God calls us to is always greater in the kingdom than where we've ever been. And so we looked at some verses last week from Romans chapter 10. And again, I said we kind of need to go in these backwards, but I'll go through them forwards. And in Romans chapter 10, it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And we looked at the conclusion of this, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That section from Romans chapter 10. As some get those things confused, we, we're good all the way through, and then it says, how can they preach unless they're sent? And we, in our modern day world, have associated that with, you need to go to seminary first. You, you can't preach unless you've got the credentials. And it's foreign to what the text was in the context of what Paul is writing to, to believers in Rome. You see, there was no seminary. There was no higher education level to be able to make you official, there was none of this false dichotomy between clergy and laity that we have today. The command was for all. And all had been sent. We looked at that weeks ago in the Great Commission. All have been sent, so it's a question of, do you want ugly feet or beautiful feet? Do you want the Lord Jesus on that day where your body no longer continues to function the way that it does, and you've taken your last breath, and you're in the presence of Jesus, do you want him to say, wow, oh, there's some mighty fine feet you've got. Well done, good and faithful servant. The call was to all of us to go. So today what I want to talk to you about, to wrap this up, is that we selflessly follow a self centered God. We selflessly follow a self-centered God. And to the person who is not a believer, not a follower of Jesus, this sounds kind of weird. What do you mean he's a self-centered God? Well, let me just throw it out this way. If 
the purpose of everything that God does was not to glorify himself, how could he then be God? Well, think about it for a moment. If everything that he did was not about bringing glory to him, but to someone or something else, he would therefore cease to be Almighty God. He wouldn't be worthy of all of our praise anymore. And for us, we are to live selflessly following this self-centered God. So I'm going to take us to this text, Isaiah 43, and just take a look at, let's say, the first 13 verses of it, and I'll put them all up on the screen. We'll kind of use this as a launching pad. I'm going to talk about three things about this text, and I'm going to have four things at the end to talk about, about our response. Okay, so if you need to jot these down, I'll give you the first one. We were made for the glory of God. Okay? We were made for the glory of God. Now, you can go back and you can read from cover to cover in the Bible. You can start in Genesis 1 and see that everything was about the glory of God. You can flip it open in the middle, take a look at something like chapter 67 of Psalms and see that it's all about us exalting him and sharing what we've experienced with others. You can flip ahead to Revelation chapter 7 and read about the multitudes from every nation, tribe, and tongue who will be there glorifying God. The whole deal, the whole story is all about God getting the glory. And the first part you need to know is that we were made for the glory of God. Now let's get into chapter 43 of Isaiah. And if you were to back up a little bit in chapter 42, you would see things are not well. Isaiah is writing in time where things are not going well for the Israelites. They've been disobedient. You may remember some of these things as we went through the story and tried to walk through the progression of what's happened with God's people. And they've been a disobedient bunch. And they don't feel like conquerors, like we just sang, because they've not been experiencing all the fullness of life that God wants them to, because they've been trying to experience the fullness of life as everybody else around them has done. And have not been following God, but God uses Isaiah to speak words of promise. He says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. You will walk through the fire of oppression. You will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Friends, are we not talking about a loving, compassionate God, or what? But now, O oh Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O oh Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Anybody just get done singing words like this? Hmm, wonder where that came from. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from east and west. I will say to the north and south, bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. Friends, if you want to get a proper perspective on life, and where we fit, and trying to seek out what purpose is in life, I can tell you there's great big sections at the bookstore that will try to do that. And they will all talk about how it's all found within you. God's Word says something entirely different. If you want to know what your purpose is in life, why you were created, number one, we were made for the glory of of God. And that has ramifications about how we choose to live and how we choose to seek out purpose and value and make a difference in the world. But we have to start with a deep understanding that we were made for the glory 
of God. I love how it said in those verses that, that he would call those all who would come. And yet, the Israelites missed it and went around it and dove under it and avoided this truth that God had said all the way back to Abram. You will be a blessing and others will see me because they've seen the way that you live. We were made for the glory of God. Number two, we were saved for the glory of God. We were saved for the glory of God. Isaiah continues, Bring out the people who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. Gather the nations together. Assemble the peoples of the world. Which of their idols has ever foretold such things? Which can predict what will happen tomorrow? Where are the witnesses of such predictions? Who can verify that they spoke the truth? You are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There has never been and never will be. It's the reason that God has saved us. God has saved us for his glory. i got to tell you, we watched um, Noah recently. Oh, I just saw Jackie just made the worst little on her face. Who else has seen the movie Noah? Now, if you've been here for some season of life, if you were here during that part of the story, you know within the first two slides of text, Things went terribly wrong in the story as God wrote it in Genesis. Whew, it was an interesting movie. I'll give you that. Fantastic fictional things. I just wish they would have used like different names for the characters and things like that because it was, it was interesting, but whew, it missed the mark of what God had in telling the story of Noah. Why we have preserved for us something that happened thousands of years ago. And it's about that we were saved for the glory of God. And Noah in that movie so far missed that when he believed that God wanted when they got off the boat to see mankind no more. That Noah and his three sons, his wife, and one daughter-in-law would perish, and that there would be no more children. How far from what God has wanted from the beginning, which is to see us saved. When we sinned, God made a plan. God did not say, okay, Adam and Eve, you sinned, whoosh, and cut them down. Instead, he put a plan in motion that wanted to see us saved. For telling of one day when Jesus Christ would come, and he would... Stomp on the head of the serpent. We were saved for the glory of God. One of my favorite passages in Ephesians, talking about the great mystery. And that how what happens with us is on display for all those in the heavenly realms. Those who are with God, those who are opposed to God. And that they will see God's great plan because of the free will that we have and the choices we will make to follow this loving Savior. Even though He allows pain and tragedy in our lives that we cannot explain, that we will choose to love Him. We were saved for the glory of God. God gets glory when we live in such a way that shows we are dependent on Him. The third point you need to write down. We are driven by the glory of God. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are his disciple, then it must be for the glory of God that you drive on each day. And the end of this section, Isaiah says this, I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. 
First, I predicted your rescue, then I saved you and proclaimed it to the world. No foreign god has ever done this. You are witnesses that I am the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I have done. I love these promises. I love these promises that no one can snatch anyone out of my hand and no one can undo what I have done. Our lives are driven by the glory of God. And so I've got four things for you to jot down, and maybe one of these is a spot where you're at in your walk of faith. Okay? Number one is followers. We do not compare. Jesus' life is our standard. We do not compare. Jesus' life is our standard. See, what is pride? Pride is a comparison of my status to someone else's. And as followers of Jesus, the standard is what Jesus has set. As followers of Jesus, it's never about saying, hmm, I wonder if my faith is as strong as theirs. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing better than them over there. I mean, I don't do all the things that that person does. Do you remember examples of that from Scripture? Jesus talked of one. He talked about a Pharisee who was in praying versus a man who knew he was a sinner. And the Pharisee looked at the other guy and says, Oh, great God in heaven, I'm glad I'm not like him. I tithe 10% of what I have. I do all the right things. I'm so glad I'm not like him. And the other guy couldn't even look up. Couldn't even raise his head, but he beat his breast and said, forgive me, I'm a sinner. You see, it's not about comparing myself to somebody else as a follower of Jesus. And yet, even devoted people to Jesus get this wrong at times. Think about Jesus on the beach. Jesus has called out to the guys, hey, have you caught any fish? They're like, no. And he says, try throwing out your net on the right-hand side of the boat. They're like, hey, we've done this before. And all of a sudden, it starts sinking the boat because of all of them. And Peter strips off and almost walks on water again. This time he runs. He comes to the beach and spends time with Jesus. And at the end of their encounter, after Jesus has made breakfast, Jesus is speaking one-on-one -on -one with Peter. And he has that conversation three times, do you love me? Remember that one? Do you remember what Peter does at the end of the conversation? When Jesus tells Peter how he's going to glorify him through his death, Peter turns to John and says, what about him? And Jesus responds and says, I don't want you to worry about what happens to him, even if he lives forever. I don't want you to worry about what happens to him. I want you to follow me. And it's the call that God puts on every one of us. Now, I will say this. There is a healthy way to look at the lives of others. There's a healthy way that when we look at somebody else and we are encouraged by seeing their faith. Paul would write those words. He wrote to a church and said, imitate me. Do the things that I have done because you have seen me as a man of faith. You've seen me go through persecutions and yet still walk and follow Jesus Christ. There's a healthy way to compare to others, but there's a terribly unhealthy way when we look at others and say, at least I'm not as bad as them. As followers, we're not too make our lives about comparing. Jesus is the one who has set the standard. Second thing, as followers of Jesus, we do not despair. Jesus' presence is our hope. We do not despair. Jesus' presence is our hope. Um, I read a very disturbing article. I won't repeat the name. It was about a woman who is a singer. And she has 
wrestled with, for much of her life, being a lesbian. And she's coming out now saying about how she feels like God is always with her through this. And by coming out now and finally seeking a relationship with another woman, that she feels more complete in God. See, that's one of the oldest problems of faith is going by feel and not fact. If I'm to read in God's Word, He has very specific instructions in Old and New Testament about relationships and about consequences and about what His design is for man and woman. And if we get caught up in feel, we can get off track. And it's the same thing that can happen to us in other settings where we begin to despair because we're not as far along as we wanted to be. I don't feel as close to Jesus right now as I want to feel. And if we let the feeling get in the way of the fact that Scripture says at the point where you've decided you want Jesus to be your Savior and you've repented of your sins and you've turned to Him, your status has changed. You are a citizen of heaven. You are co-heir with Christ. It's not about, do I feel that way? And so sometimes we let our feelings get in the way. We get a sense of despair because we don't feel like I'm as far as I wanted to be at this point. You see, the truth is that only Jesus can make you good enough. Our feelings about, am I good enough, are not what drives us. It's about the fact that He lives in us and His Word can change us. If you're experiencing a season of despair right now, I want to encourage you to do the one thing that you can do most. Cry out to Him in prayer. Dig deep in His Word and see the truths of people who have experienced difficult times. Read through the Psalms and see the way that David struggled with people after his life, and yet he's able to come back and praise God and to see that there is a day that's coming that far surpasses any experience I'm going through today. Let his word come alive in you. Third point. We avoid apathy because Jesus' words are our authority. We as Christians have this great temptation to come and to hear a message and say, hmm, that was interesting. And do nothing with it. That's apathy. When God's truth is revealed in front of us and we begin to see that the way that I'm living my life is not lining up, we have a choice to make. Will I let my life line up with what Jesus has taught? Or will I choose to hope that I'm getting points for showing up? Christianity is not about going through a routine. And apathy is prevalent in the American church. Because if it wasn't, the world would look different. I'm going to talk about my friends Grady and Becky in just a moment and catch up with a little video of something that's going on. I'm going to spoil it for just a second. Their hope is that when the UN gets there, they're going to be able to say, thanks but no thanks. The church has already risen up, and Christians from around the world have supported, and UN, we don't need you at this point. Because the church of Jesus Christ has stood up and has supported and shared. And they're seeing something amazing I'll get to in a second. You see what? Jesus says is what determines your life if you're really a follower of Jesus. And as followers, we can't live by apathy and just say, well, we're kind of indifferent. And, and I'll take some and I'll leave some. And I won't, I won't really let all of what God's Word says soak into my life and come back out in the way that I live. That's apathy because we believe in the authority of what His Word says. Last point. We avoid lethargy. Jesus' glory is our goal. We avoid lethargy. Jesus' glory is our goal. Have you ever seen something that's lethargic? 
No, we love that in Mushu. He's our bearded dragon. And he has that season called brumation, where he takes his little log and he crawls underneath of it and he takes all of the newspaper that's in his cage right there and he scratches it and digs it up and shreds it into pieces and then he crawls underneath of it. He's not dead. He'll stay there for months like that. He won't get out to eat. He won't get out to drink. He doesn't do anything but just lay there. He's alive, technically, but on all other appearances, he's dead. In fact, I don't know if you've heard me say, I ran into this with a cashier at Walmart one time. I was picking up something, and the lady said, yeah, my friend had a bearded dragon, but it's like it died. I mean, it just went in one corner and just laid there, never moved, and so we threw it away. I'm like, you don't understand. You just threw away a live pet. They do that. Some seasons, we do that. You see, here's the difference. Apathy is an indifference to what Jesus said. Lethargy is a laziness in applying what Jesus said. See, we don't want to be lethargic in applying what Jesus has said. And it's a dangerous temptation for devout followers. We just get seasons of being beat down. Things have been going rough. And we just kick back and say, well, I know I'm saved. And I hope that's good enough. And Jesus doesn't want lethargic followers. He wants followers who are actively engaged in a battle. Because that's the way that Scripture describes the walk of faith, is that there is a battle going on. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's about powers and principalities in the spiritual realm. So the way that we fight is altogether different. The way that we live our lives is different. So I want to encourage you this morning, if one of these four areas is something that you realize I'm not there, would today be the day that you would make a choice and say, I want to be an engaged follower of Jesus Christ. So I want to highlight the story of a couple one more time. I showed you the picture a couple weeks ago. Um, Grady over on the right-hand side, I have to tell you, I've never met him in person. I know of him. I know about him. He's from Colorado. He met Becky, and they got married, and they started having kids. And again, this is an older picture that's just got four kids. They've got five, and you'll see a, a more current picture of them in a minute. Becky went to school with me in the little town of Breckenridge, Michigan, known for just about nothing. Population 1,200, and I always joke with people, I think that includes some of the cows. My parents live on 8th Street. They had a golf course built in their backyard. It was Dad's idea. It was awesome. Got the village to use that land that was never going to do anything. Got a nine-hole golf course built. They built on the back side of that on green number nine. Across the street from them is a dairy farm. Eight streets, that's it. One end of town to the other. Not too much going on. And yet, this lady decides, I can't just say that I follow Jesus and not follow wherever he calls me. And so, Becky and Grady have been living in Iraq for the last four and a half years, as you heard me say. For most of that, they didn't tell people where they were really at because of the screening that happens of Facebook. They're at a point right now where they actually will announce that they're from Iraq. And so, we have been praying for them because of what's going on with ISIS and the murder of innocent children and other Christians. Brady Excuse me, Grady had an opportunity um, through an old friend to do a report on ABC News down in Florida. And so I'm going to share with you this just over two-minute clip of a report that was done to share the story of what they're doing with their lives because Christ has called them. Take a look at this. Now to the crisis in northern Iraq, and specifically the Americans who are there trying to help refugees. Tonight, WPBF 25 News spoke with a family who's there. U.S. military airstrikes on ISIS targets allowed many of those refugees to escape the mountains where they were trapped without food or water. Reporter Randy Hall joins us now. Randy, the threat there from ISIS is certainly not over. And those ISIS fighters getting closer to cities with American humanitarian workers. We spoke tonight with one family originally from Colorado who now lives in Erbil, Iraq. That's where airstrikes from U.S. forces are basically the only thing keeping those Islamic militants at bay. 
Displaced in their own country, refugees flee northern Iraq, running from ISIS Islamic militants bent on genocide. Many will end up in the Basirma refugee camp, where they'll run into Grady Pickett from Colorado. When I go to these camps, they always ask me, Grady, where is America? Grady and his family of five young children have been in northern Iraq for almost five years. Lately, it's been terrifying. ISIS getting closer. Just this week, militants kidnapped more than 100 women and children. ISIS just swept in and people ran, fled for their lives. Uh, we met one, one little girl and she's playing in the street and a mortar landed in the street, killed her two sisters. She was wounded. American airstrikes authorized last week have slowed the militant advances. I mean, everyone was just about to panic. The airstrike started. I think everyone breathed a little sigh of relief. It gives Grady and his charity time to help the refugees. They're focusing on bread. The family's raising money for the operation back home on a GoFundMe campaign, the pickets in Iraq. And more refugees are coming. The U.S. military authorizing a small group of special forces to rescue refugees from a mountaintop how we move that population uh, off the mountain into a safe place. So American forces on the ground trying to save a village while American volunteers work to keep thousands more alive. You know, just cry with them. It's not much else you can do, you know, just weep with the weeping. I think we're going to be okay. Just have to stay brave and <laughs> have some courage. And so far, so far, so good. We have posted a link to the family's GoFundMe page over on our Facebook page. Meanwhile, the UN upgrading the humanitarian situation to level three. That is the highest emergency level. Live tonight, Randy Gillenhall, WPBS 25 News. And so this morning, I checked in on it, and um, their GoFundMe page was at $12,821. They've got a plan. This began as a ministry because of what was happening over in Syria. And those who were exiting Syria looking for freedom in northern Iraq. And so now not only do they have the Syrians because of all the wars that's been going on over there, they have as well people coming from the south who are trying to escape ISIS. And so they went from 9,600 to 128 in just a matter of days. Um, the $100,000 that they're trying to raise will help them to be able to do several things. It's all about providing bread. And if you go to Google and search GoFundMe and then say pickets in Iraq, you will get specifically to this page. And you will read on there the story of the ministry that they are doing to provide bread because it's so significant to family life there in Iraq. And the amount of bread that a family consumes and how they've already begun with the level that they're at and what they've been able to do and how they want to be able to get to the point of delivery trucks and the bicycles they want to have to be able to, to take this out in the ministry. But if you were to go there and become friends with uh, Grady and Becky and just start going back through their history on Facebook, of the number of people that they've been able to share the love of Christ with, it's mind-boggling. The way that they have expanded their home, not because they wanted a bigger house, so that they can house more people who are transitioning in and out. And the number of times you see pictures of them with others, and the way that they are attracted to them because they see an American face and they hear somebody who can speak Arabic to them is phenomenal. And so they've taken the time to show care the way that Christ has called them to. And so if you're looking for something that you want to be a part of making a difference, I stand behind my friends and what they're doing. And you can see on the right-hand side, if you were to scroll down on that web page, as people are giving gifts, hour by hour, as people are contributing to this. There's one that's not in there that I think she'd made a mention of, of a church somewhere that was given a donation of $6,000 to do this. And so I just want to encourage you of what it looks like to be somebody who is a radical follower of Jesus. And for some, they're going to go places like this, and they're going to risk their lives. And they're going to say, Jesus, it was never about me. It was always about your glory. And for others, it's someplace a little closer by, someplace a little nearer to them. You know, the statistic is it's less than 60% of Wells County attends church. 
And we talk about, you know, there's almost one on every corner downtown. And yet, a great portion of the people around us don't even attend church, let alone have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The need is all around us for us to say, Jesus, open my eyes and let me be a radical follower of you. The question is, will you choose to put your faith in action? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, today I thank you for your great love. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have called us as followers. First of all, just that you've called us as followers. But in that, Lord, you have told us the truth from your word that you have prepared works in advance for us to do because we're followers of you, because we know that we're saved, because you've made a change in our lives, in our hearts, in our spirit, in our soul's condition. You invite us to join the work that you are doing. So Lord Jesus, whether it's near or far, would you help us to have ears to hear, hearts to listen, and feet that you would one day call beautiful. Lord Jesus, help us to go beyond where we have been in our faith and to be radical in the way that we live. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.